In 2012 alone, the U.S. spent more than $50 billion in anti-drug efforts and arrested more than 1.5 million people for nonviolent drug charges. Yet the U.S. continues to rank among the top five countries when it comes to per capita recreational drug use, according to the U.N. These stats have led to a complete shift in perception when it comes to one of the most popular recreational drugs in the world, marijuana. In fact, last year, for the first time ever, a majority of Americans favored legalizing the drug after Washington and Colorado became the first states to do so. But according to a recent investigative report by Lee Fong at The Nation, that reality may still be a long way off thanks to Big Pharma's contribution to anti-legalization efforts. To help me break down the report, I'm joined now by RT political commentator, Sam Sachs. Hello. What's up, Sam? What's up? So start by going over what companies and organizations are actually behind this anti-legalization effort in the U.S. Sure. Well, this is pretty interesting. As you see, as you mentioned, those polls are moving toward legalization. You're seeing more and more laws introduced that, uh, that either legalize marijuana or decriminalize marijuana or legalize medicinal marijuana. And you would expect the opposition to come from maybe moral groups or healthcare groups that have the same sort of problems, maybe with smoking or drinking alcohol or something like that. But instead, you see the opposition coming from companies that want to protect their bottom lines and protect profits, uh, basically protect markets that they have a stranglehold on right now. So you see, uh, as you mentioned, pharmaceutical companies coming out and uh, funding, and this is uh, thanks, as you mentioned, reporting by Lee Fong, funding organizations like Partnership for Drug Free Kids the uh, Community Anti-Drug uh, Coalition of America, and Project Sam, which was a group started by Congressman Patrick Kennedy, who got busted on painkillers, wrecking his car, and decided that <laughs> marijuana was the ultimate uh, evil drug in America. What you see are pharmaceutical companies funneling money into these organizations to advocate against um, uh, marijuana legalization laws. You also see uh, the prison industrial complex companies related to that, like uh, private prison companies, police unions, and you see beer and tobacco companies uh, coming out and funneling money into campaigns to stop ballot initiatives that would uh, uh, legalize or decriminalize marijuana. It just seems completely immoral for like the organization for drug-free kids is accepting money from giant pharmaceutical companies that are peddling pills. Yeah, it, it does, and you, you don't see these same organizations uh, putting the same effort in toward into getting people hooked or getting people their addictions to addressing the addictions people have toward uh, Vicodin or certain opiates or, or painkillers and that's really what's behind these pharmaceutical companies funding these organizations is there are tens of thousands of people right now who take painkillers and it's known that marijuana can replace painkillers with less side effects uh, and, and not kill 16,000 people a year like these painkillers do. Yeah, good point. Uh, it's just really disturbing. Um, and, and you mentioned really quickly police unions. Why in the hell are police unions involved in this? Well, a lot of uh, police, uh, they, they get funded through community grants, usually through federal grants that require them to bust people who are smoking pot. So a lot of their income comes from arresting people on marijuana. Same thing with prison guards. Look, a lot of people, hundreds of thousands of people get arrested every year uh, for marijuana-related charges. Uh, that equates to jobs in the prison industrial complex. That equates to people needing to guard uh, all these prisoners. And we hear uh, each month about these contracts that private prison companies make with state governments where they have to fill up 90% of their prisons with criminals to, to, to make a profit there. Well, if you can keep pot illegal, you can get a huge supply of criminals that way. The prison guards I get more than the cops. You would think that the cops would be like, great, we don't have to like arrest people for low-level drug charges now. Well, I think if, if you look at what individual police officers are saying who, on this issue versus what yeah. kind of the entrenched police interest groups are saying, th th there's a, a disconnect there. But, you know, unfortunately, we have a system that's profitized so many things from law enforcement to incarceration to health care, and those industries are stepping up and kind of uh, you know, picking their sides in this debate over marijuana legalism. And it's also these groups that are that are keeping marijuana classified as a Schedule One drug, which is actually comparable to heroin, crack, cocaine. Um, yeah. Really, really bizarre. Uh, I don't well, understand the how, they're, how are I mean, they keeping that there when two states have legalized it already. Right. This is the DEA that <laughs> still keeps marijuana scheduled as a Class One drug alongside all these uh, very terrible drugs that you mentioned right there, which is completely. 
Bizarre, but it, it, it's kind of what you would expect from the, the, the political and economic class of America right now. If you remember this weekend, I'm not sure if you remember, if you watched Meet the <laughs> Press, I probably didn't, didn't learn nope. much, but they had a whole segment uh, this weekend on marijuana legalization, and they had four panelists, you know, columnists, people who are respected in, in media and in, in political fields, and not once did, did they bring up the drug war as a reason mm. uh, to address marijuana, the, the, the failure of the drug war, the way that it's carried out on racist lines. Uh, that wasn't brought up once, but instead you had canards like marijuana raises or decreases your IQ by six points, or it's something, it's a habit that people just grow out of, so we shouldn't legalize it. It's just, it seems like policymakers it's don't understand erroneous. the frame of debate, right? No, they don't understand it, and they're all taking painkillers. And uh, you know, you hear like Rush Limbaugh, the, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, what so, has happened? You're talking about legalization and decriminalization efforts. I mean, talk about a case study. Let's talk about Colorado really quick. We have about a minute left. But what has happened there in terms of jobs, tax revenue? Chaos. It's, <laughs> it's complete chaos. It's Zoo. just like the movie Reefer Madness, where people are just <laughs> running around, jumping out of windows and stuff. Um, no, you know, it's we, we haven't had much time to really study the subject yet, but you've had 10,000 jobs created in Colorado uh, since they legalized marijuana in that field. Uh, you've had $10 million in revenue coming in, and you've had crime go down about 10% in Denver. Again, it's early to tell what's happening, but not the sort of chaos people were predicting uh, would happen if you legalized the drug. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sam Sachs, breaking it down, as always.